Right, you know, why don't we get started um, just so we're, we're finishing on time, okay? So um, I'm Kathy Kennedy, I'm the Iconic Land Trust Senior Manager of Outreach, and I wanna thank you so much for joining with us tonight for this program, um, which examines the state of Long Island's native forests and the impact of invasive plants and insects. Um, in recognition of National Invasive Species Week, we feel it's a, a timely conversation to have tonight, and we're grateful that you spent some time with us this evening. Um, on a housekeeping note, you are muted during the conversation, so um, at the end we'll be answering questions. So if you want to put questions into the Q and A, please use the Q and A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, tonight we're excited to partner with scientists from Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County, uh, Long Island Invasive Species Management, also known as LISMA. Um, and a respected local arborist, all of whom study, educate, and work tirelessly to mitigate the damage to our woodlands and, from invasive plants and insects. Before we get started, just a little bit about the Peconic Land Trust. Um, the trust was founded in 1983 with the mission to conserve Long Island's working farms, natural lands, and heritage. And with your help, as well as the support of thousands of individuals, partner organizations, foundations, community groups, and all levels of government, we've protected over 13,000 acres of land, including over 6,000 6, acres of protected farmland, um, wetlands, meadows, woodlands, um, all that provide local food, places to explore nature, offer habitat for wildlife, and of course, to protect water for drinking, fishing, aquaculture, and recreation. All of this and more we're able to do because of your support. So thank you very much. Um, for today's panel, I'm pleased to introduce you to Abby Bezrutsik, Project and Outreach Coordinator, and Haley Gladish, Invasive Species Specialist, both of whom are with LISMA or Long Island Invasive Species Management, Dan Gilrain, Entomologist with Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County, and Jackson Dodds, our certified arborist and owner of Jackson Dodds, Incorporated. Our moderator for tonight's program is Mina Vicera, who's a nursery and landscape specialist with Cornell Cooperative Extension. Since to, uh, 2013, Mina has been the nursery and landscape specialist for Cornell. She serves horticultural professionals by coordinating educational programming, conducting applied research, and assisting with plant diagnostics. Mina loves to foster appreciation for plants and to share her passion for growing and caring for plants. Before I turn the program over to Mina, a final reminder on the Q&A, um, just use the button at the bottom of your screen to pose your questions and we will get to as many of those as we can at the end of the program. So with that, I'm gonna turn it right over to Mina, thank you. All right, thank you, Kathy, and good evening, everyone. It's wonderful to be here with all of you to discuss the important topic of forest health. So I have the pleasure of introducing all the speakers and moderating the Q&A. So our first speakers of the evening are Abby and Haley. Um, Abby and Haley, while I'm reading a bit about you, why don't you go ahead and share your presentation? So um, as Kathy mentioned, um, Abby and Haley are of LISMA, and they both joined um, LISMA last year in the spring of 2021. Abby is the project and outreach coordinator for LISMA. She plans field projects such as surveying for and managing invasive species and works with the LISMA team to coordinate um, outreach and education about invasive species. Haley is LISMA's invasive species specialist and she helps coordinate with the LISMA partners for management and monitoring. She applies for permits, very important, for new and ongoing projects and helps to monitor the tracking and mapping tools of iNaturalist and iMap invasives for any emerging invasive species. So Abby and Haley, thank you so much and please take it away. Thanks, Mina. Thanks for the introduction. Yeah, we're really happy to join and honored to be among this panel of professionals. Um, and we'll be kicking off the night with an overview of invasive species issues in our forests. Whereas our other uh, panelists will be talking a little bit more specifically on some subjects, but we'd like to start off with giving an overview. So as Nina said, we represent the Long Island Invasive Species Management Area. I'm Abby Bezretzig, joined by Haley Gladich. And um, LISMA is a voluntary partnership of many organizations from Staten Island, Brooklyn, Queens, Nassau, and Suffolk counties. 
we're one of eight partnerships for regional invasive species management that cover all of New York State. So New York's actually pretty special in that regard that we have so many areas that um, are working together to address invasive species in the state. And um, part of our mission is to reduce the threat of invasive species in our region through field projects, but also through education and outreach opportunities like these ones tonight. So uh, now I'll hand it over to Haley. Thanks so much, Abby. Yeah, so before we really get started, I just wanna cover some vocabulary that you might hear throughout this talk. So first we have non-native species, and these are species that have evolved in a certain region over the course of hundreds or thousands of years. They keep the balance of an ecosystem as they have organisms that they consume or otherwise keep in check, um, and then organisms that consume them or keep them in check. An example of a native species would be an oak tree in our forests. There are also non-native species, and these are species that have been introduced either purposely or accidentally to a place, and they might have a neutral or even positive effect on the environment. For example, many of our, our crop species, like tomatoes and cucumbers, are not native species, but they're not necessarily bad. And lastly, we have an invasive species, which is a non-native species, but one that's actually disruptive to the balance of an ecosystem and does so through a number of tactics, such as rapid spread, high reproduction, and even some invasive plants in particular can actually alter the physiology of an ecosystem in order to favor their own survival. So then what exactly is an invasive species? An invasive species is one is a species that harms the environment, it's harmful to the economy, and it can also harm human health. Um, for example, up on top, we have giant hogweed, which is bad because it not only displaces our native species, but more importantly to us, it produces a phytophototoxic sap, which causes burns that couldn't require medical treatment. Think like poison ivy, but times 10. Um, and then on the bottom here, we have emerald ash borer, which threatens all of our ash trees in the United States, which is an extremely important forest tree. The emerald ash borer eats the vascular tissues that make up the inside of the tree and prevent them from uptaking water and nutrients and essentially kills the tree. So then what's the point of preventing invasive species from our forests? Why are we all here really? Um, oftentimes we think of conservation in order to protect maybe an individual species. Sometimes we think about monarchs and milkweed, spotted salamanders, bald eagles. However, invasive species not only threaten that individual species that they might be predating or that they might be competing with, but they also impact the larger ecosystem that these organisms live within, which on Long Island are especially small already due to, the, due to development. Long Island not only has numerous rare and endangered species, but it also has numerous rare and globally threatened ecosystems, such as coastal grasslands, our maritime freshwater and interdunal swales, and our pitch pine scrub oak barrens, which are pictured here. These ecosystems not only provide habitat that are, that are home to so many beautiful animals that we adore, that we get really excited to see when we go on a hike, but they also provide countless services to us, such as water filtration, buffers from storm surges, carbon sequestration, and habitat for pollinators required for agriculture. So really the functionality of these forests free from invasives is imperative to the high functioning of the services that we benefit from daily. And now Abby's gonna help us sort of zoom back out a little bit. Yeah, so thanks Haley. Before we get too in the weeds with invasive species, um, it's helpful to zoom out and try to understand a little bit more about them. For example, why are they so prolific in our forests and what advantages do they have that help make them invasive? and what's working in their favor. It might not just be that they have um, some innate ability to uh, be invasive, but maybe there are some things in our environment that are making it so that gives them an advantage. So talk a little bit more about that. An important place to start is talking about disturbance. So when it comes to forests, invasive plants are able to enter the scene most, most easily in areas of disturbance. But what does disturbance actually mean? Um, disturbance can be defined as any event that is relatively discrete, so happening over a limited time, um, that disrupts the structure of an ecosystem and changes the availability of resources or some aspect of the physical environment. So that's really a lot of words to talk about something that you're probably already familiar with, um, such as disturbance, um, so, so storms, wildfires, and native pests can all cause disturbances to some extent. You know, storms, they'll knock down trees, um, and that's part of a natural dynamic cycle that happens in forests and create, creates new opportunities for trees to fill in that, uh, that growth. 
same thing with wildfires that can while it can be destructive it also can be um, a way for a uh, forest that's adapted to that to regenerate and likewise native pests there can be native pest outbreaks that kill a certain number of trees or other other plants or even um, you know herbivory that happens from uh, you know mammal herbivores but that's all part of um, a natural cycle of disturbance and some pattern and frequency and that makes kind of a natural regime it's what our ecosystems are adapted to so disturbance isn't always bad it's actually part of a healthy cycle but there can a lot of the times we're living in this altered regime this different pattern of disturbance in our forests and this can give invasive species a great advantage for a few reasons i'll highlight in a moment so some examples of human mediated disturbance are development as Haley uh, mentioned so which can lead to forest fragmentation so you've likely heard of habitat fragmentation meaning like you know animals habitats are not as close together but building roads buildings and houses not only breaks up habitat but also makes more edges to the forest so that kind of creates more opportunities for invasive species to be introduced through human movement plantings or other accidental introductions just kind of makes more edges for those um, scenarios to happen and forest edges also make a higher light environment, which some invasive species can be better adapted to and thrive in compared to maybe slower, go slower growing or shade loving native species. Dan will talk about invasive insects a little bit more, but basically um, the dramatic canopy gaps that are caused by invasive insects and the tree die off can make greater light ability that invasive plants can thrive in um, if they're already present so they can take advantage of that disturbance. And the last three I'll talk about in a little bit more detail, highly abundant deer, invasive earthworms and climate change, how they can um, create disturbances that give invasive plants uh, an advantage. It can tip the balance towards invasive plants. So in changing the conditions of the environment or introducing disturbance, um, it can favor invasive plants. So um, deer and invasive worms come into this in a few different ways. For example, um, deer are highly abundant herbivores in our area. Some might say um, too abundant, but it wasn't always this way. In fact, about 100 years ago, they were so um, in low abundance, there were actually initiatives to increase their abundance. And now we're at a very farther end of that scale. So um, these highly abundant herbivores will eat um, basically the, the tasty native plants while avoiding some less palatable invasive plants. So they'll eat oaks and even pitch pines and leave behind less palatable barberry and stilt grass, as Haley will mention. And this herbivory has a lot of different impacts, but one of the things it means is that um, we have a lot of adult trees that are out of that browse height, but not a lot of the mid-story trees or saplings. So when a large tree falls, that gap might be open for a longer time than normal, allowing invasive shrubs to enjoy the sun, create an opportunity for other um, species that appreciate that disturbance um, to proliferate. They could also um, influence the spread of seeds in some cases too, so they can be a vector for, for invasive species movement. And jumping worms are also pretty interesting. So, um, or invasive worms and uh, non-native worms in general. So. You might think of worms as being a good thing in your garden, which they can be, um, but they're also altering the nutrient cycling and soil structures in our forests. So there are actually virtually no native earthworms to the Northeast, which might be surprising. I remember, I was very surprised when I heard about that, um, but because when the last glacier came down that basically formed Long Island, um, it scoured all the earthworms from the system. Um, and I mean, Long Island wasn't even there, so I don't know if they're but there were earthworms there at all. <laughs> um, so the earthworms that we have now are uh, either from Euro European varieties or they're from Asia, as is the case of jumping worms or uh, of this, the genus Amenthus and Metaphyr. So these worms, jumping worms, are particularly good at eating this rich organic layer of soil that's really important for our forests. Um, this organic layer of soil creates an insulating layer that some species uh, might need for overwintering their seeds, protecting their roots. Also, there are native uh, macroinvertebrates that are really important for decomposition in the forests. 
and um, just the general nutrient cycling that happens in the soils. But when these worms eat this layer and consume it super rapidly, you lose that organic layer, you changes the structure, it makes a, uh, the inorganic layer higher, and um, it ma making more nutrients available isn't actually a good thing in many cases because it's not what our native plants are adapted to. So invasive plants, and on the other hand, often are um, being able to take advantage of these conditions. If you're interested in jumping worms and learning more about this, there's this great group called the Jumping Worm Working Group and a great fact sheet about this. Um, I, it's not, I don't think it's just great because I made it, but um, a lot of information about identifying features of jumping worms and also things you can do about them. It, maybe you've seen them. And so we'd love to hear about that. Also, before I move on, these deer and earth invasive earthworms can interact in really interesting ways, just to show that it's a, it's a complicated system. Some studies have even showed that where deer are exposed, there's a lower earthworm abundance and this effects become stronger over time. So there's a lot of complicated interacting factors here that are tipping the balance towards invasive plants. And lastly on that list, there's climate change, which is going to impact our forests, forests by creating even more disturbances through droughts, floods, and hurricanes. I mean, we heard about that tornado that happened uh, a few months ago. How crazy was that? And allowing invasive species ranges to expand. Um, and so it's really important to focus on the resiliency of our forests for the future in relation to climate change. If you're interested in more about invasive species and climate change, this group, the Regional Invasive Species and Climate Change Management Network, has really great resources, including this management challenge. Um, so you should definitely check out their resources if you're interested in this. And lastly, invasive species have their own advantages that help them thrive over native competitors. For example, um, they have no natural predators. So the herbivores or herbivorous insects that are from their homeland are not here to keep them in check. Additionally, they might have a high reproductive output. They have a lot of seeds or they're able to reproduce asexually by maybe plant fragments that, you know, maybe you're managing them, you drop some plant fragments on the ground and then they could re-sprout from that in some cases. They're also can be highly adaptable, um, handling high nutrient soils, as I mentioned, and they can be fast growing, growing in height or area quickly that helps them to compete for life. Great. And now I'll turn it over to Haley. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Abby. And I actually, that is a really great fact sheet. You should check it out if you do get a chance. <laughs> you can go to the next slide. So yeah, so now we're just gonna talk about some general impacts that invasive species have on our ecosystem. Um, and these are just a few, and we're gonna go into more detail and we're gonna look at some of the functional groups of species, but then kind of dive deeper into some specific species and their effects. So first we have some herbs or some grasses, which for example, we have Japanese silk grass and it's an herbaceous plant that's found within the Pine Barrens region. Um, that's really effectively under invading our understories. It leaves out early, it shades out all sorts of species from other herbs and our like spring ephemerals and other grasses and wildflowers, as well as shrub and tree saplings. Um, when the base of our plants or our ecosystem are unable to grow then, the pollinators and herbivores that rely on them are also impacted. So it's really important that we try to remove things like Japanese silk grass. As well, later on in the season when the grass starts dying back, it creates a thick thatch of dead leaf matter, which can increase the fuel load of a site. This means if there's any sort of accidental arson or combustion that might happen, um, the burn that could take place could potentially be bigger and hotter that that ecosystem can handle. And then the survival rates for the tree species um, and other sort of plant seedlings in this otherwise fire dominant ecosystem, um, this burn might be basically too hot for them to handle and they might be cooked out of the soil. Next, we have shrubs um, and we have the example of Japanese barberry, which is an invasive shrub all across Long Island, um, but also a very a long time favored horticultural plant. Um, and again, this plant is displacing our native shrubs um, instead of ones that might provide more nutritious fruit for our native wildlife. Some studies have actually found that birds that stop over in places with abundant non-native shrubs actually have lower body mass compared to birds who have stopovers in areas with native shrubs with native fruits. So there's that impact there of, you know, food nutrition for our wildlife, not just, it's not any berry, you know, feeds them. It's about that important nutritional food. And lastly, barberry can have, um, 
these really interesting microclimates that are actually super favorable for ticks. Um, and as deer walk through, as deer walk through these shrubs, they can be, you know, the ticks are more easily able to attach onto them, um, as well as mice that might like to live in these uh, little microclimates as well. And we have vines. So vines like bittersweet and ivy like to tangle themselves around trees, which can cause those trees to be more susceptible to disease. As the vine stems, you know, wind around the tree and rub on the bark, as well as leaves that might not die, like especially with ivy, ivy's evergreen, um, it can create openings for wounds or it can just create increased moisture that can allow all sorts of diseases to potentially kill that tree or damage the tree. Um, and if that didn't get the tree, um, those fast climbing vines can grow up those weakened trees and really increase the, wheat, the weight of those trees. And then in a heavy storm or rain, um, they're much more prone to falling over and, and they're already weakened state. Yeah, and then how are we doing on time? Just wanna make sure. Um, hi, Haley. You have, um, I think we're until about 6.30. Is that okay with you? Oh yeah, that's perfect. I just wanted to make sure. Okay. Yeah, great. So yeah, you might be thinking, what can you do? So there are plenty of things you can do to help prevent the spread of invasive species. Um, you can advance the slide. <laughs> Did it go forward? My, is my Wi-Fi frozen? Maybe. Um, oh, I can hear you. I moved the slide. Do you see it? Okay. No, it might, it might be frozen on my end, which is totally fine. Oh, there we go. So yeah, you can report invasive species. Sorry. Funky Wi-Fi here. Um, we have mobile mapping tools like IMAP Invasives and iNaturalist, and that can help you to map invasive species wherever you see them. And then folks like us on our end actually can go ahead and check the invasive species or on iNaturalist, for instance, any sort of species that you might've seen, and we can figure out if they're invasive, if they're impacting our forests. Yeah. And you can plant smarter. So by knowing the plants that are supposed to grow in your backyard, you can maybe find those ones at local plant stores and native plant stores um, and plant them instead. You can avoid planting invasive species. There's lists, you can go to the DEC website and see the lists of regulated plant species and prohibited plant species, um, as well as plant species that maybe are on our blogs on our website that are not listed as prohibited or regulated plants, but ones that are becoming invasive. Um, yeah, and really learning what those native species are are so important. And again, we have resources on our website as well for places of where to buy native plants, because I know that can be difficult to find. And making sure to clean your gear. This is super important. So before, after you go on a hike, being sure to clean your boots, making sure they're free of any sort of dirt or seeds, and not just your boots, but also maybe hiking poles, making sure your backpacks are free of seeds, making sure your pets and strollers might be free of seeds as well. So again, it's important to do before and after you go on a hike. Yeah, also, I guess that last one as well, not moving firewood is a huge thing too. Um, not moving firewood, I think, believe it's 50 miles from where it's originally cut. <laughs> yeah, and then lastly, removing invasive species. So oftentimes we think that the invasive species in our yard, while they might, or all sorts of plants in our yard might be behaving all right in our, it, you know, in our backyard, in our front yard. Um, and we forget that our yard exists with nature kind of beyond the confines of our fences and our streets. Um, and, you know, the ivy that we might be growing up our tree might look pretty and nice, but if the bird eats the seeds there, it can bring it over to the next yard or the forest next door. So making sure that we cut those vines, we remove those invasives, and maybe if your yard is free from invasives, that's great. Volunteer with local organizations. There's so many more <laughs> to remove. <laughs> yeah, so thank you. And we're excited to hear from all the other panelists this evening. And if you have any questions, you can feel free to put them in the chat as well as reach out to us if you have any more specific questions about invasive species and what we do. All right, thank you, Abby and Haley for that wonderful presentation, for that look into how invasives affect our uh, natural landscapes mm -hmm. and also our ornamental landscapes. Um, I really like the graphics in your presentation, by the way, <laughs> I'm jealous of them. Uh, now we're going to move on to our next presenter, which is Dan Gilrain. So Dan, if you can go ahead and start sharing your screen, I'll, I'll introduce the folks. Um, I'll introduce you to everyone. So Dan Gilrain is an extension entomologist and the um, Associate Agriculture Program Director for Cornell Cooperative Extension of Suffolk County. 
Mm -hmm. His work, 35 years and counting, with cooperative extension includes insect identification, pest problem diagnosis, educational programming, and applied research on pest problems of food crops and ornamental plants. And we're in for a treat tonight to learn about all sorts of insect pests um, that affect our forest. So Dan, thanks so much and take it away. Okay, well, great. Thank you very much, Mina. It's great to hear from uh, Abby and, uh, and Haley on that as well. Really interesting and good, good information. Thank you. Um, this is kind of the poster child for invasive species, or one of them, uh, gypsy moth, which was introduced to this country uh, about 150 years ago with the intent to raise uh, these caterpillars for silk production, which they don't produce very well, and it obviously failed. The caterpillars escaped, and the rest, of course, is history from there. And some of you will remember some of the enormous amounts of defoliation experienced, especially in the uh, 1980s that we saw from gypsy moth. And we have seen bouts of that since. Uh, since that time, uh, another non-native uh, beneficial organism, a fungus has come in suddenly and unexpectedly to help bring this under control. Uh, but if it wasn't for that, we would probably be experiencing repeat uh, um, problems with defoliation from gypsy moth again. Well, that gives you an idea certainly why we don't want them. But another idea that uh, we wanna keep in mind is that the forests are home, not just to uh, these plants that we like, like oak trees that we like, but also to other species that we also appreciate. This is a native insect called the hickory horn devil. This is a remarkable creature. It's a caterpillar and the moth stage is on the upper left. This is a photo from Vicky Bustamante taken out east. And um, this is really an amazing one. It's harmless, although it looks rather ferocious and fearsome, but it's really a privilege if you ever get to see one of these things. They're, they're pretty awe-inspiring. And the host list is on the left and they probably feed on others besides what's on there. So these are not very common anymore and they seem to diminish with the size of our forests, but these are still found. And one of the, just one of the many, many examples of the kinds of things that we like to preserve uh, by having our forests. And here's another one. This is a periodical cicada. It's not the average cicada you hear buzzing during the summer, but it's the, it's, uh, the same one that you heard about that was inundating areas around DC and in Maryland this past year. This, of course, is a different brood. This one was out in 2008 and next will be out in 2025. Uh, we don't see large numbers nearly like they saw in Maryland, but these uh, find their home in our forest areas and sometimes in the urban forest areas too, and depend upon trees for their existence. Um, and they uh, are pretty remarkable when they, when they come out. It's an amazing thing if you get to see. Picking up a little bit on what Haley and Abby were talking about, this is an aerial shot over the South Fork. And you can see in the distance some browning in the very center. Those are a lot of trees, uh, pines, pitch pines that have been killed by the Southern Pine Beetle. I'm not gonna really talk about that. Jackson, I think is gonna address that a little later on, but that is another example, of course, of why these invasive species are troublesome. This one actually is a native insect that is now becoming more comfortable in our environment. And it seems to be a climate change that is probably allowing that to happen. That's making for milder uh, conditions. We don't see the severe cold and the average of the lowest temperatures is rising. That seems to allow them to prevail. But in, also in this picture, you can see some other issues. Um, we have, of course have a lot of habitat fragmentation where there's developed areas, but also we can see there's houses that are built within the forest area. And when people build and put uh, places in the forest area, they're going to bring, bring plants and other things with them. They're campers and trailers that might be harboring other creatures with them as well. So there's uh, different issues that this, these create and do cause problems, of course, with insects and invasive plants and also uh, invasive disease problems that these plants can have as well. So our forests are really under stress for a lot of reasons, and um, it's kind of an inevitable march towards this, but these are just some of the ones that occurred to me that I could write down on a short list of the ones to be concerned about, and I'll just talk about a couple of these. Um, so these are uh, ones that we're either dealing with or we expect to be dealing with in the near future. Um, it's not all doom and gloom um, because we certainly have a lot of partners, including many of you on this call and this, on this uh, meeting today to help in dealing with this issue. Uh, this is just some of the many partners that are with us working together to try to be sentinels watchful for this, to uh, sound the alarm when anything new is found and get it diagnosed accurately. Also, and uh, as Abby and Haley often are doing is directly 
removing, eradicating them personally by hand on some of these uh, sites, getting rid of some of these. And there's many partners that I've shown here. Some of them are not, not mentioned, for example, would be, say, Bartlett Tree, uh, Arbor Jet, Jolly Green, uh, private companies, uh, Jackson Dodds, who's with us on this call, um, and Long Island Nursery and Landscape Association. These are all organizations that are working and partnering together to address these kinds of uh, invasive plant, insect, and disease problems. Um, some of them that are not here are outside of our area, such as UMass, uh, who had that where there's been a research program looking at uh, mitigating some of these problems, such as the winter moth that I'll talk about in a little bit here. So we have partners inside our area and outside of our area, and we're all working together to try to address these problems. And that really is the, a, a good message to take away from today. Uh, this one is Asian longhorn beetle. Some of you will remember this back in 1996 when it was first discovered in Brooklyn, has since been found in many other areas, including out in Illinois, Massachusetts, Ohio, and now in South Carolina, as well as also in Toronto. Um, the many, it's been eradicated from many of these sites, which is the great news, but there are still some lingering infestations, particularly in South Carolina. That's a worrying one since much of it's in a wetland. Um, there's some still lingering in Massachusetts and a small amount probably still in the Amityville area based upon a sighting of a couple of individuals this past fall. So this is not over with yet, but the good news is it has been eradicated from many areas where it was found and that eradication is in process right now. Um, beach leaf disease is one that we are dealing with right now and is spreading a bit like a wildfire throughout much of the region. This is the symptoms shown on an American beech leaf it also affects European beaches, like the copper beaches that we so value for landscapes. Um, and beaches, a valuable plant, of course, for wildlife in our forest areas, really common one that we see there. These are some of the symptoms, and I listed what some of those are on the right-hand side there. This typical banding, which you can see, especially with transmitted light, is a pretty solid evidence for beech leaf disease. This disease is, um, we, th we think, is brought on by a small nematode, a little tiny eelworm. You can see they're microscopic in the upper left of this photo. And these are right now resting in the buds uh, over winter and they will be coming out and eventually getting inside the foliage. The consequence of this infestation is what you see here. You get distorted kind of leaves, stunted leaves, and sometimes no leaves and no buds grow at all. And it can get pretty dramatic even more, and this is sort of the consequence of what happens and the trees can eventually die as a result of this. This uh, disease is now spread pretty far just within a few years of discovery. And you can see this shows the areas where it's been found even as far as way as of Maine. We don't really know how it's spreading and how it's moving around. There's some suspicion that it's due to birds just because of the uh, rapid nature of the movement. Um, it looks like we may be losing our beech trees uh, as a consequence of this disease, but there is work going on right now to try to figure out what to do about that, at least in managed areas and managed landscapes. There's a number of uh, entities looking at treatments that might provide protection or control, and this is one particular site that I've been treating, and uh, we're going to be watching to see how well this works. This is a basal bark treatment with a phosphite material uh, that may enhance the ability of the tree to uh, fight off or resist the disease, resist the problem, which we know works for another disease that beech trees get. We're going to see how well it works for this particular one. And this year we'll hopefully get more results on the research that's going on. And we appreciate certainly all of the partners that are working with us to help find this solution and uh, see how we can move forward with that. Uh, I call this the next worst thing. This is spotted lanternfly. It's a kind of a plant hopper. Uh, it has mouth parts that are sucking tight. They, they're like little, little uh, uh, needles that go into the trunks of trees or twigs and feed on the sap inside the tree. And by doing so, they deplete the reserves that the plant has and uh, uh, weaken it. And since in some cases can even kill them in the case of, in the case of grapevines. This has been found um, in Bohemia now in Western Suffolk County and will now be spreading throughout much of the county and the area. We'll be seeing much more of this in the days and years to come. Uh, it was found in 2014, first of all, in central Pennsylvania, in Berks County, in sort of, sort of the central eastern part of the state, probably brought in on stone from Asia. The egg masses are laid uh, almost anywhere, and they're very indiscriminate where they'll put their eggs. So they were probably, we think, brought in on the stone to this area 
and has uh, uh, now since spread from there to all of these areas in blue have established populations or infestations and it has spread quite quickly as you can as you can see just from this map and um, this is what it, it looks like in later in the fall it has one generation and these are the adults that, that'll be active around the end of july into the fall and they are fairly large they're almost uh, about an inch and a half inch long or so big very very large for a plant hopper and uh, their appetite is about equal to their size. So they really are voracious feeders and here feeding on grapevines. This is the big problem is that they like to feed on grapevines and will deplete the reserves. They've even killed vineyards in Pennsylvania when they're found in high numbers. And they are often found in high numbers when they're found in these uh, areas where they've invaded. This is a, a threat to our forest trees to some extent. We haven't seen very much mortality of forest trees as a consequence of infestations, but they are adding to the stress and adding to uh, uh, weaken the trees even further. So if there's other stresses such as a defoliation event from canker worm or gypsy moth, this won't help the trees to have an additional insect that's feeding on it and depleting the kind of reserves that are meant for the tree, uh, but going instead to the plant, to the uh, plant harbor, the spotted lanternfly. And you can see the very high numbers that are building up can be sheer, sheer annoyance when they're on the trees that are in your landscape. And that's, I think, where we're going to get a lot of complaints about it, where people are seeing them. And the sap that they produce, the sticky material uh, coming out of the trunk there is attractive to stinging insects and flies and other things. Uh, tree of Heaven is, an elite, is a non-native tree and is their absolute favorite host. So it's somewhat satisfying to think that they're going to be attacking this tree and, and feeding on it very heavily. But unfortunately, they don't kill it. And uh, in the course of doing so, uh, feeding on it, they actually reproduce even better. So this is a, a really a sad thing about it. And Atlantis is an invasive tree that's found quite widely through our area in uh, native area in the uh, native forest areas as well as, of course, disturbed areas too. It uh, also likes some other kind of tree hosts and a list of some of the other sort of preferred ones are there on the right. It will feed on many, many other things, however, not just these preferred hosts and Tree of Heaven. But when it feeds on Tree of Heaven, it reproduces better than on anything else. And, uh, and that will be a, a problem as we'll see going forward here. Just to give you a sense of what this looks like, these are the immature stages that you'll see during the spring and summer, late spring through summer, uh, the earlier stages on the right and the older stage with red on the left, the fourth, fourth instar fourth stage from late July to September, and then the adult on the left side there. Uh, below in the center is an egg mass, and it gives you a sense for how difficult it can be to actually see these, and especially because they like to lay a lot of them in the upper part of the canopy where it's very hard to look anyway. So it'll escape notice easily until the numbers get to be pretty high in the fall and then the adults, which are pretty hard to avoid, uh, are, are present. You can report sightings to any of us. Uh, certainly, we would like to know about that, but there is an official website that is accepting reports of this, at least for now. And once it becomes a little more widespread, I think we won't be looking for any new reports anymore because we'll just, just understand that it's uh, pretty widespread. But this is the email address you can send a report to. And you can also, if you suspect, you can send a picture to any of us or to that, or to that email address, uh, that would be just fine. There's also a way to report through the website on New York State IPM that's indicated there. And here we have Jen Stengel, who's modeling the latest in lanternfly couture on the on the catwalk at one of my presentations upstate. Um, so uh, emerald ash borer was mentioned, and this is a serious pest. Uh, this is what it looks like. It's a small beetle, a flat-headed borer, so named because the immature stage has a very flat head, so that it can live in the cambium layer, that thin layer right under the bark, and that's where it does all its feeding, and is doing so destroys the living and growing part of the tree. And it has a typical very characteristic D-shaped exit hole that you can see where the adult has emerged from. That's not where they go in, that's where they come out of the tree. And this is where it, I have had reports of it from around Long Island. And now emerald ash borer feeds almost exclusively on ash and to some extent on fringe tree, which is another native tree, but that's not terribly common here. But ash uh, also is not terribly uh, widely native on Long Island, although we have a small amount of native ash here. It is much more common native tree upstate. Ash is, however, widely planted as a street or amenity tree in our landscapes and along the roadsides. And that's where uh, all of these reports are coming from are from these street trees in our urban forest areas. And um, so that just gives you an idea how an invasive species can take advantage 
of our own practices to uh, promulgate itself and spread around. Uh, so, and that's the, those are basically the last, last reports I had. I am sure it's much more widespread than that map would even indicate. Uh, this is a picture taken of green ash growing in a landscape that has a lot of trees that are being attacked and so therefore breeding a lot of the beetles uh, that are coming out and now seeking to do some feeding on the foliage before they uh, fully mature and then are able to produce eggs. So this is uh, what they look like, give you a sense of the size. They're about three quarters of an inch long or so. And you're, they're often not observed because they're out for a fairly short period of time in the, late, in the uh, late spring around early June through the end of June or so is typically when we, when we see most of their activity. But their evidence is hard to see inside the tree until the woodpeckers come along and they can hear the larval stages feeding right under the bark. And in order to get at them, they flail away the outer bark so they can find and locate where those larvae are beneath. And this is how we discovered it in Southold for the first time on the tree on the right. So their homeowner was wondering what is going on with this ash tree? Why is this bark getting flailed off like this? Well, it's the woodpeckers that were removing it, looking for the caterpillars, not the caterpillars, the larval stage that's right underneath in the cambium. And on the left-hand side is a tree that's got some of the same kind of injury from woodpeckers, but it's much more subtle. So you can see that there's a little bit of the bark that's been flailed away, but not very much. But that still is a good indicator that this tree is under attack by emerald ash borer within uh, underneath the bark. And uh, by, that, by this time, it can be a little late to actually try to protect the tree or control it. On the right-hand side is just a tree that's got a lot of bark that's, fl that's uh, flaking off here because of the uh, cambium that's been killed and the tree is no longer alive at this point. And this is just an example of what's going on. This picture was taken out in East Marion. There's a street out there that has about 50 ash trees that are losing uh, all, all of them uh, due to emerald ash borer and the trees are in this kind of condition at this point. Um, on the way to happening, the, uh, the uh, infestation will cause this kind of a scenario where you see a lot of the trees showing decline and the dieback and maybe some of this branching, the epicormic shoots, as they call them, bushing out from the lower parts of the trunk and the lower limbs. Unfortunately, ash, when it begins to die, often becomes unstable and it can break apart rather suddenly. So be very careful if you have an ash tree that's large and is being attacked um, and contact an arborist for assistance if you need it to be removed or treated. Another one that is, uh, this has uh, got a, a good and a bad part of the story. This is a uh, multiflora rose, an invasive species that is often in our native and wildland areas, a really annoying one to be around just because of the thorns and sort of taken over in some places. But there's a disease, a virus that is spread by a tiny mite and called an areophyid mite on the upper left. So it's an invasive plant that's being attacked by an invasive disease by, uh, that's transmitted by an invasive mite. So there's some uh, moral satisfaction in that and it's really nice to see but unfortunately, it's, and, and although it does kill the multiflora invasive plant here, it also can attack and kill our uh, garden roses as well as you'll see here. So that's really the unfortunate byproduct and shows you, and yet another example of how, how our natural and forest areas and native areas are very well connected with our urban areas and how one can um, be a problem or, or issue for the others. So that's just one example. This is winter moth and we've started to see this about 10 years ago. This is a non-native insect from Europe, another invasive that we're finding. It's called winter moth because the moths, the males, are the ones that actually fly. They'll do their flying around the end of or middle of November or so into December at the time of year when it seems too cool for insects, but they are perfectly happy flying around that time. It's the caterpillar stage that does a lot of the damage and you're showing them there on the left. These are sort of typical inchworm type caterpillars, but they can uh, pack a real punch and they build up in really, really high levels like this. This has been a big problem in Eastern Massachusetts, building up to huge numbers, killing trees just from the sheer repeated defoliation year after year. And we have this on Long Island, but it has not gotten to this outbreak status uh, until maybe this year, uh, we're kind of wondering what's gonna happen. I've been putting out traps to see what's going on with it. We've also had help from Haley and Abby on this as well to uh, monitor in several areas around Long Island. And this is one trap I set up a couple of years ago. Uh, this year, 
one of the traps had, I would say, a really, really large number of these moths in it, much more than I would ever suspect. So it was, these traps are not designed to control it, just to help monitor and detect it. They, they can't actually control the population, but it's just giving me an indication that there's a really high number around, and we had very, very favorable conditions for the females to lay eggs in last fall. So we're gonna be watching to see if this one actually increases and becomes a serious pest. Um, Abby mentioned about these invasive Asian earthworms, and I just wanna pick up a little point about what she was talking about. This is an uh, earthworm that does feed on this upper surface layer of the soil much more than our, native, than our other earthworms do, the other ones that you're more familiar with. And as such, they churn up this upper layer into this granular-like material and, and uh, take away a lot of the organic matter in the course of doing so. Well, this kind of substrate is no longer favorable for growing plants in, in general. It's not a good place for seeds to start from, uh, say, if acorns and other things that want to grow. This is not an ideal substrate for those to get started in. So it's not a good thing. Um, and it, this is just an example of what that kind of looks like. So this upper layer becomes very, very loose, and you can pick it up like this. It's not, not a good thing. And it's also not good when it's in your garden. One of the things it's doing is it's um, uh, consuming the mulch that we put down. So even these small aggregates can get consumed and they'll be buried over time. And if you're trying to maintain some kind of a mulch cover on the garden, this can work against you. You can use large aggregates or large bark aggregates to help fight this. That does help. That's one way to address it. But it's moving around probably on plant materials. So some of the home gardeners that are not having garden plant sales anymore in the Hudson Valley as a result of this. So they can try to keep it from spreading from one garden to another. So those are some of the kind of invasive things that are on my mind. And um, I'd be glad to uh, answer any questions after the, after the presentations. Thank you so much, Dan. It's always eye-opening seeing what um, you have to share. Um, we're gonna move on now to our final speaker because I know there's several questions coming in and we will certainly get to as many as we can um, after Jackson's talk. Uh, just a reminder, if you do have questions, it's very helpful if you put them in the q and It just allows us to order them better and um, it allows us to see them. I noticed that some of you have put your question in chat. If you can go ahead and copy and paste your question, if that's not too much to ask and put it in the q and I would do it, but I can't put questions in the Q&A as a panelist, um, but I will certainly, um, I will do my best to not forget the questions that were in chat. I know Kathy's gonna address that as well. Okay, so yes, our next presenter is Jackson Dodds. And Jackson, why don't you go ahead and start um, sharing your screen and I'll introduce you to everyone. So Jackson has been spending time amongst the trees and plants of the Hamptons for as long as he can remember. He founded Jackson Dodds and Company Incorporated in 2011. At 18 years old, he was recognized as the youngest certified arborist in New York State. That's a cool thing to have on your resume, Jackson. Um, a past president of the Long Island Boricultural Association, he continues to be a steward for the responsible growth of the tree care and landscaping industry on Eastern Long Island. So thank you, Jackson, and please go ahead and start your presentation. Thank you, Mina. And thank you, Kathy and Conic Land Trust for having me and the other panelists, uh, Abby and, and Haley, that was visually stunning that presentation. And I learned a lot as well as Dan for all the years you've helped. I've uh, been an arborist for quite some time. And uh, this was all pre-internet, uh, I would say. And I'd call Dan regularly from Cornell and all the Cornell staff. And they'd always give me great information and show me where they find it in books. And that was a long time ago. But um, <clears throat> at that time, and Dan touched based on it, was the, the um, I got into the industry right around Asian longhorn beetle and the gypsy moth. And, you know, at that time, I thought it was the end of trees. There would be no trees. They, not knowing very much about it and watching the damage by the gypsy moth just to foliate all the oak trees out east, the eastern end of Long Island. I didn't think there was much hope. And, and certainly after listening to the presentations, if you're new to this, um, there is hope. Uh, it's not all gloom and doom. Um, certainly I'm still in, been in business and uh, have learned a lot. Uh, so I wanna focus on the native forest where I live, in particular, the threats and opportunities. This is kind of a picture. I, I, I pulled a lot from Google Earth. It's I enjoy flying around pretending I'm Superman, looking at how the uh, times have changed on Long Island. 
Um, and certainly the threats now, and what Dan had touched on was the Southern pine beetle. And this is a little example of what we've been experiencing um, out east, uh, primarily in Northwest woods. I mean, certainly further west in Hampton Bays where there are the pine barrens. And, and uh, in this case, this is a client's home where there's mature white pine that are still green, but the, the pitch pine that are certainly suffering from the Southern pine beetle. Uh, as Dan said, that it is a native beetle, but it's certainly further south where I think with climate change and the warmer winters, we don't have that deep freeze killing these insects. And as it moved into our native forest, they found a home. Um, and certainly in its numbers, it, as you can see, um, it tends to kill the trees. And the Southern pine beetles, bark beetle infest pine trees, uh, very small, two to four millimeters in length. And I'll have a picture for you. Um, the insect is native to the southeastern United States. Now in the Carolinas and, and south, they can lose 10,000 acres. And because it's so wooded, it's less known. But in a residential area such as East Hampton, and a lot of this is around East Hampton just to be targeted, um, it makes a huge impact in the native environment. Um, <clears throat> The beetle was first found on Long Island in 2014. Now, Dan, I think you identified it or were one of the first to identify it. I remember seeing it up in Hampton Bays quite a bit and asking you what that was. And, and you, you found that this tiny little insect here, if everyone could see it, it's about the tip of a, a pen or a pencil uh, in numbers will dominate and, and destroy a tree. They'll, they'll move 30 feet in when it emerges as an adult and it'll create these, these galleries, they're called, and lay more eggs that will emerge and move to the next set of trees. So you can see that it might look like it's coming from a distance, but it comes very quickly. And um, in East Hampton, you know, and back in 2014, um, 2015, 2016, when, when the uh, Ranger Service started to get involved with controlling or managing uh, the forests in Munns Park is some of the er earliest ones that I remembered after seeing a presentation on the Southern Pine Beetle about that time. Uh, we worked with rangers in trying to uh, cut down and reduce uh, some of these infected trees to slow the spread of it and, and not knowing too much other than, you know, an insecticide application was really out of the out of the arsenal or out of the tool part, uh, toolbox because it would require such a vast amount of treatment, it would actually be adverse to the environment. And certainly we're not pushing for insecto, aerial insecticide sprays to control this insect. Uh, so at the time it was a matter of just cutting them down. Uh, this is again in residential. So we, it wasn't a, necessarily a drop or a cut and fall into the woods, but more of a, a, a rigged or, or um, a removal that took skills. And this is more in the backyards and in the residence that we work in. Um, you can see after it moves through an area, there's very little left. Um, the initial thought was to cut everything down to grade and that it would help slow uh, the spread. Um, what, I don't know if the beetles got this memo, but it certainly continued to spread. Um, some areas that weren't um, cut remained, these trees remained dead and became quite hazardous. These, these pitch pines, you can see the white pine are less infect, are affected, but this was a full canopy. And you can see the low bush blueberry uh, at the ground. Um, and unfortunately, due to the removal of the the trunks and the debris, it, it does do a tremendous amount of damage to all the native species. So it's not just the beetle uh, killing these pitch pine, but it's also the human presence of trying to eliminate all that potential fire uh, or um, fuel for a fire and or cleaning up properties. This was quite overwhelming for the properties of the north that, um, sorry, northwest woods where it's primarily pine and also just on the, the barrier or the edge of Nepeague stretch where it's primary, primarily pine barren. Uh, here's an overview of Northwest Woods. And um, 
this was 2017. Go slow here. You can see how light the area got as the trees were infected and were removed. And this was town, county um, coming together to reduce and, and remove some of these trees to slow it, slow the spread. You can see the most affected areas. Um, and it, it, it spreads in tendrils, one would say, and, and where the, the heaviest areas of this pitch pine were, it certainly attacked that first. Um, here's another picture of what it looked like originally in 2017. Uh, zoomed in a little closer, and I want to also bring to everyone's attention that the it's two holes of water, it's called. It's a natural uh, glacial um, pond. It's very low at this time. And I find in 2017, it, there was a lot of drought and a lot of stress on the trees. And a stressed tree will tend to attract those insects uh, a little bit more readily wherein you can see it just it left the white pines, but certainly devastated the pitch pines. Now, stressed trees in a, in a residential landscape can be managed a little bit better with irrigation, with uh, feeding, but in this large scale native forest, uh, the, the beetles are certainly uh, dominating and taking over. Um, again, this is what it looked like before and after. It's it's a big change. Uh, just not to jump around too much, but going back to the process of getting the trees out, this is the general canopy and what it looked like in Northwest. And you can see these are infected trees. And this that was that is this year uh, or this past year or this year, January 11th, um, as it as it continues to spread. A lot of this still standing. Um, uh, trees that were infected from years ago, and now that the beetles have moved on, it poses more of a hazard being that there is a, a driveway here. And you can see the bark just peeling off, a lot of woodpecker, woodpecker activity, a lot of uh, benefits for uh, the birds, we'll say, and often we'll leave, leave a few of these if it's not in a, uh, a hazardous area for the birds as a, as a housing, as you can see here. This is deeper into the wood, so it doesn't necessarily, uh, if this tree were to fall down, it would unlikely fall on somebody or on a house. Trying to maintain some of that understory growth, there are trees that are cut down in the, in the, in the back, in the background, um, but the blueberries seem to be growing up through it. This is the uh, town of East Hampton trying to manage it. Again, their priority is safety and it's over the streets. Um, uh, this is a very time consuming, expensive uh, prospect to control these trees. Often they'll spray the chips into just these giant piles in the woods. Now, it was said that if the chip was small enough, it could potentially disrupt that insect. I think it was smaller than an inch. Um, but we do still find, being that there are other trees that are infected that aren't showing yet, whether that the chips there are still encouraging the spread or if it's just from the surrounding trees. Um, this is another example in 2017, uh, just off of Route 114 between Sag Harbor and East Hampton. You can see it's just completely decimated the area. Um, this homeowner here saw it as an opportunity, or maybe not an opportunity, but uh, certainly something to deal with and started to re-landscape their property. Uh, many of these houses just have piles of, of logs and trunks laid down um, that were left after uh, the trees became too hazardous and, and in the process of managing these situations. Very likely, if any of these are pitch pines, they will also um, be infected over the next couple of seasons and will will die. A um, few white pines are remaining. Again, this goes back to uh, 2017 and just the massive loss of trees uh, in this area. And I guess where I'm going, part of it, part of it is that. Uh, it wasn't necessarily a monoculture, but there weren't very many trees and diversity in these in these woods as they grew up for years. 
I'm a local here in East Hampton, and my grandfather lived not too far from here on a farm. Uh, it was the last dairy farm in the area back in the early 1900s. Um, and he would tell me stories of these areas that were just swamplands and it didn't have these large trees. And he showed me pictures of, of them getting or growing and what the area looked like. So to see them as big as they are in the canopy that they create, it really reduces comp or competition from other trees and, and plants. So there's not a tremendous amount of diversity here, even though it's beautiful in itself. And you can see these are all great big trees. And this is right back in, uh, East Haven Court or East Deer Court um, in East Hampton, um, just devastated by the Southern Pine Beetle. A lot of the area looks like this because the cost of putting the tree on the ground or cutting it down, um, the town provided uh, services for them to be cut down, but not to remove the tree. And in most cases, it was probably a better idea to leave the tree Unfortunately, I think for real estate, um, real estate <laughs> people don't want to look at piles of, of wood and have many companies come in to remove um, all this downed material. And you can see how it piles up here. So um, the few oaks that are left, we're seeing a lot of these trees just snap because it's not working together as a, a forest unit and it's exposed more to the elements in the wind. So we're seeing a lot of trees just snap, but there is there is a lot of uh, new growth that's coming up. And you can see the white pines that are working their way up through all that all that trunk and woods. Uh, the blueberry, the low bush blueberry is really um, thriving now that I see. And even small pitch pine are starting to pop up. And that's if nothing is done, if it's just left as it is. Um, you can see this was, again, a fully canopied woodland, and most people had purchased houses in these areas for those trees, and now it's almost back to uh, an open field. Again, here's more oak trees that have just been sheared off from the wind um, from this drastic, this very quick change in the environment. Um, and unfortunately, I'm seeing it in white pine as well. I haven't seen it kill the white pines, but these are all infected uh, trees. You can see the popcorn shaped sap that is coming out or frass that's coming out of the tree trunk. Um, I guess we'll see next spring how this um, has affected these trees. Um, certainly, I hope that's not going to be the, the end of the white pines as well. Uh, so what happens next? Now, we can look at it two ways. It's terrible. It is terrible. I'm not good with change. And to see these are forests that I grew up in, grow up in, um, change so quickly is upsetting. But it could be also an opportunity. Uh, we've worked quite a bit with East Hampton Town Natural Resources Department over the years, and they have a great uh, guide to native species and native plantings and how to plant them and, and so forth. Um, but I, I pulled this out of there. Um, out of their resources and with the expanding development of residential and commercial commercial regions. Oh, this is right. One second. We have fragmented large areas of continuous contiguous uh, native plant communities. As new parcels of land are developed, they become a disturbed habitat. This occurs through the construction of man-made structures, clearing of native vegetation. And indirectly, that's what's happening when we're trying to clean out these trees or clean out the dead pines, and in many cases can occur with the introduction of non-native plants for landscaping purposes. Good quality, pristine native plant communities are disappearing at alarming rate. As native plant communities disappear or are compromised by invasives and exotics, many native plant populations are becoming increasingly rare. Ecosystems are becoming compromised with invasive alien plant species, and biodiversity is thereby threatened. Therefore, it is critical for us individually to do our part to promote native species and to control non-native species. So with me saying that, you know, this is the damage that can be, that will happen through this process or through the uh, uh, Southern pine beetle. If, there, if there's an area that's already has invasive plant species, they'll take off. It's like throwing gasoline on a fire. Now it has no competition. For example, the Japanese knotweed, 
Um, this is a very aggressive uh, plant. And as you can see, it's invasive. It, once it establishes with very little competition, and certainly that, that competition primarily is sunlight, right? And, and also uh, water and soil. Uh, it just thrives and it'll dominate an area and choke out everything. And you can see how aggressive it is. This is a picture I found that it, it's actually growing through the foundation of a house. Um, mile a minute is another invasive uh, vine. Now this is an annual plant, uh, but these seeds will store in the ground for three to five years and they create a seed bed. And while, <clears throat> while we are actively trying to control it. And you'll see some of the native, native sedges that are doing well. You can see the, in the perimeter of the uh, forest, uh, the mile a minute creeping in and everything. There's a lot of competition here and that mile a minute grows so quick, it'll, it'll dominate that sedge over time. Whereas in the shade, the, it's very unlikely to see as much activity. Um, you can see there was a treatment made on this mile a minute earlier in the season. And because there's so many, there's so many seeds in the seed bed, it just grew right back up and through. And you can imagine how fast they grow with a name mile a minute. Um, so the best, best way to approach this control is physically hand pulling it and being ready to come back two, three, even four times throughout the season to pull out the, the new, um, a uh, new uh, mile a minute. Now, what we found after treatment it is also it'll adapt. And it being that this non-native or even native plants, their sole purpose is to reproduce. And in this case, it actually set a new, new leaflets and fruit at that stage. So it didn't necessarily grow out to be uh, meters of growth. It, it only needed a few inches. Um, as you can see before it started to put premature seeds. And if, if we allowed this to go to full term, it, they would turn blue as well, fall into the, into the ground and also uh, germinate for the following season. Now, as you can see, doing work in these forests, you're also, you're also uh, prone to ticks. And I'm glad you guys brought that up before because working in areas trying to manage some of these invasive species, and this is just a field of invasive species, it, it feels like, <laughs> it looks like, uh, but you can see the mild minute just took over. And what we're seeing is from those unkept uh, raw areas, they're moving into, it moves into the landscape. So that prior picture was just on the other side of this evergreen hedge, where in the winter, the only thing, there's nothing green about this evergreen hedge. It, it's the mile a minute has, overgrown all the spruce trees, all the all the, the plantings that this homeowner had put in. And um, in the summer, the only reason they haven't cut down the trees because in the summer it's green with the mile a minute, the invasive. And then in the winter, it's, uh, it's, it's pretty bare. You can see it growing right out to the end and that disrupts photosynthesis or the, the health of these larger trees. So even that small annual vine will take down a mature uh, evergreen. This is some a project in Southampton that we worked on trying to manage, but it's just, it's a, it's a very large task. And I'm trying to give a, an idea from the ground what this looks like, because it is um, uh, pretty overwhelming at times. So that the opportunity I was talking about before, and it's primarily in the landscape installation, uh, diversity of native landscape plants will be key. Um, now, granted, these aren't all native plants. This is Japanese cedar here, but these are Eastern red cedar. And the difference between these two are that the deer are feeding on, on the, the native plants as opposed to the non-native. Um, and I don't know if there is an exact uh, native planting that can give you the same uh, screening and also the diversity that the deer aren't going to feed on. But this is, is the beginning of uh, some plantings. Now, Leland Cypress, which I'm not fond of, I would not recommend planting these. They were also introduced in this planting, uh, this landscape. The Eastern Red Cedar, again, were completely fed on by the deer. But there, that's, it's a very linear landscape planting, where if there was some depth to it and using more natives, you can accomplish 
uh, the screening that they were looking for. And this was part of um, a previous slide where they were just decimated. The, the, the woods became a field and now they were scrambling to try to get some coverage of 114, the, the street there. But I, I can certainly see with the foundation of these plants adding to that, we're creating uh, some understory plantings to the eastern red cedar uh, will help give the density and keep the deer off the more, the more desired plant material. This was, um, let's just see how we're doing on time here. Uh, so this is the guide to the natural uh, the native plants, natural plant communities, and exotic invasive species of East Hampton Town. It's always been a good reference. Um, I'm not going to go through this list of trees and shrubs and plants, but they are there. Uh, there's also a list of what the deer are, are keen on eating and what they don't, uh, but these are available plants locally and native. Um, unfortunately, you, you might have seen pitch pine on that list, Probably not a good idea right now. I think we've seen enough damage in the pitch pine. Um, Kathy, how are we doing? Or Mina? Uh, Jackson, if you can start wrapping up, because um, I want to make sure that we have time for Q&A. Um, and I can share that East Hampton resource with Kathy so she can get it to folks as well. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Uh, so this is some areas that were cleared the second year later. Uh, even though the, a lot of the blueberry was damaged, it did recover. Uh, the pitch pine and the white pine are coming back. Uh, this is a landscape they use primarily white pine. Again, it looks great initially, but what's to say 20 years from now, there isn't another insect. It's great. The diversity will be key moving forward. Look at that. Thank you. <laughs> Look at that. Yeah, just the last slide. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Jackson. I loved all the pictures that you had in your presentation. It's so informative. Um, and now we've reached the time for the Q&A, and I know that there are many questions in there. And I'm just going to quickly address one question before I pass along the questions to our presenters. Um, someone mentioned, are, are there any government laws that ban the selling and production of invasive, um, of invasives? And yes, there definitely are. Um, Suffolk County actually has um, um, what's called the do not sell list. It's Suffolk County and then also Nassau County has a similar version of it. So there are plants that are banned um, for production, for transport. So if you're interested in learning about that, I will give Kathy information. Um, from that initial um, legislation that was passed, oh gosh, uh, you guys correct me if I'm wrong. I think that was around 2011 um, that that was initially passed. Um, the New York State um, DEC, they um, introduced legislation called uh, the Prohibited and Regulated Invasive Species um, Law. And that is not only plants, but also other types of living organisms. Um, so if you were to Google just New York State DEC Prohibited and Regulated Invasive Plants, you'll see that list. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll pass along um, a link for, I don't know if you can see this, this is the Long Island um, horticulture resource guide and there's lots of information about invasive plants in that list. Um, somebody mentioned how come no one has discussed bamboo and bamboo is actually banned um, in New York State. Um, it wasn't banned with the Suffolk County and Nassau County invasive species regulation and that's because it doesn't easily spread into natural areas. So it would spread if it were on the edge of a forest, then it, it runs by um, underground stems. But New York State regulation decided to include it on the banned list, um, two species on um, there, the yellow groove, and um, let me make sure I say which ones. Um, Oh, Dan, can you help me remember the other one? Golden bamboo, the yellow groove and the golden bamboo. It's a phyllostachy species and they're the running kind, not the clumping bamboo. And they were put um, on the prohibited list because of the economic impact um, that I'm sure many of you are familiar with, that if your neighbor has it and it invades your yard, it's an awful thing. So I just wanted to quickly address those two things. And now we're going to dive into some of the questions. Um, one question in particular that I kind of just remember off the top of my head that Dan, I think I'll have you address first is um, someone was asking about spotted lanternfly and basically it's invasion habit. 
is it going to be similar, do you think, as um, southern pine beetle, how Jack, like Jackson was saying, it invades a forest and it just wipes out, um, you know, certain areas within the forest. Um, do you think it will have that similar type of spread? Um, and then someone mentioned that their concern about spotted lanternfly is about the native fox grape, for example. And do you think it will wipe out our fox grapes? So Dan, if you want to take that away. And in the meantime, Jackson, if you can um, stop sharing your screen, then this way everyone will appear on the screen. Thank you so much. I'm sorry. That's OK. So I'll try to address those questions. It's good. They're good ones. I don't think that spider lanternfly is going to follow the same kind of trajectory that southern pine beetle does. Southern pine beetle has a, is pretty exclusive as to host. It really strongly favors pines and pitch pine in particular. And the way it works and operates is going to be quite different. It seems to move in these heads or these uh, advances, um, which can get quite large and extensive. But um, it, it, the nature and the way that it invades and moves into areas is quite different from the way that uh, spotted lanternfly operates. Spotted lanternfly can uh, uh, colonize an area just with one individual and start an outbreak here and there. So you can get these spotty outbreaks all around. Um, and it will be also associated with its, some of its favorite hosts, certainly, which are not evergreens, are more deciduous uh, trees and shrubs. It seems to be what it, what it really favors. So I think the pattern will will follow uh, quite differently. Um, I do think that there is a possibility it will uh, fizzle out as it has in some areas of Pennsylvania, possibly because some natural enemies have adapted to it in those areas, much as we've seen, I think, with brown marmot stink bug in this area. So I'm crossing my fingers and my toes, hoping that it uh, does follow that as it has in some areas of Pennsylvania. Um, I, I don't know what's going to happen with the fox and the other native grapes here. That's a good question. I've kind of wondered that myself. Um, but I think uh, grapes as they're grown in agriculture are pretty vigorous. And this insect doesn't, uh, it's not able to actually suck the sap. It actually re relies on the turgor pressure in the plant. And uh, with the vigorous way that our vineyards uh, are growing, uh, it's they're sitting ducks for that reason. Whereas I suspect that the fox grape may not be growing quite as vigorously. They're often growing in these competitive environments, often in sandy, droughty conditions. So I'm I'm hoping for that, partly maybe for those reasons that um, they may not be as heavily attacked or damaged as the uh, uh, managed grapes are. Okay, well, that's good to hear. And Jackson, I really liked when you made the comment about how not everything is doom and gloom, even though I know it seems like within this webinar, a lot of things seem doom and gloom. But I just want to remind folks that our forests are resilient. Um, we may not see some of those trees become large and, you know, be the um, you know, reach the canopy uh, within our lifetimes. But as we've seen with past invasions from, uh, you know, the chestnuts and the elms, even though they're no longer in our forest like they used to, there are trees that will take their place. But certainly our forests seem to be in a transition. Um, there's quite a few questions. Well, actually, Jackson, just a quick question I want to ask you about spotted lanternfly. Are folks asking you about spotted lanternfly? Do you feel the word is out um, within the private sector? Being that it's not, I'm not seeing as, as much as I have in New Jersey, but certainly um, when it becomes present on the, on the properties locally, I'm sure we'll get a lot of phone calls. So the informed and certainly the best way to combat all these invasives is information and all the people who are part of this, um, this Zoom call tonight will have that information like you, Cornell's always provided, uh, where the eyes in the field. So when we can see it, it's best to report it back. Um, as for right now, personally, I haven't seen or heard a lot of that locally. I'm sure it's coming. Yeah, I guess it certainly is, unfortunately. Um, all right, so to continue addressing more questions, um, Abby and Haley, I was hoping you could address some of the worm issues and you, Dan, as well. Um, one good question was, well, if you have these jumping worms in your yard, if you notice that kind of popcorn soil, what do you do about it? Yeah, there are unfortunately like no approved controls for jumping worms. So that's a very frustrating thing is that there, uh, you, if you want to see if you have jumping worms in your backyard, um, you can make like a, a solution of water and mustard powder 
um, and dump it into your backyard and see if worm comes up and then, um, you know, see if you can have that the milky white clitellum it's called on the worm um, and uh, for a certain number of segments from its head and that identifies it as a jumping worm. Um, it doesn't kill those worms though, it just kind of irritates them and brings them to the surface. Um, I guess at that point, if you want to put them in the freezer or lay them out in the sun for a while, that will eventually kill them, but that's not really going to get rid of them in your yard. So unless Dan, you have some other updated information, but that's as much as I know of it. Um, I, I think that's right. There really isn't any approved or known effective controls. I think the what we're trying to do is trying not to spread them any further than they already are to be aware of their Absolutely. coming from and how they're spread around. They're spread around, um, either you can carry the worms around in soil uh, uh, with a plant or they overwinter as they call it little cocoons. And these are really, really small. You can't see them hardly in the soil at all. But it would be easy to carry these in the mud on your boots uh, from one place to another or in, the, in a potted plant or with a plant you dug from one place to another. So just being aware of, of when they're present and not to move them as much as possible to new places. Yep. Okay, so there's an, I'm oh, sorry, um, Abby or Haley, did you want to make another comment about that? No, okay. Jackson, I suppose that, you know, unless these really start uh, disrupting the ornamental landscapes, <laughs> do you think you'll start getting calls about these jumping worms? I'm sure we will. There'll be interest in that. And hopefully by then you guys will have some information on how to control them. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and there's, and there's work going on about that right now, for sure. There is. It's a, there it's is. a real concern. Um, people will start noticing it when you've got a mulched walkway, for example, that's being consumed and, and turns into this uh, sort of coffee ground like, like material instead. So that'll be one of the ways that people probably first notice it. Yeah. Um, somebody just put a comment in text that they said they noticed the same worm reaction to black walnut hull juice when cleaning the freshly gathered nuts. So mm -hmm. that's an interesting that's observation. Interesting. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's yeah, something good there to know. It's a lot of tannin in in that material. So I'm wondering if tannins might have some. Uh, I'm going to pass that on to somebody. Thank you for that. Yeah, I know. That's a really cool observation. Um, someone else commented about just earthworms in general. Um, I'm just going to comment about whether I know Haley, I mean, um, Abby, I think it was you, Abby, that you commented about how there are no native earthworms. And from what I understand, that's because of the glaciers and the impact of the thousands of years that the glaciers were um, present here in the northern part of um, the hemisphere. Uh, there are native earthworms more to the south, um, but for the most part, all those worms died. <laughs> and then they were introduced, um, non-native species were introduced from European colonizers and probably other ways that we're not even aware of. Um, so pretty much, I, you know, and correct me if I'm wrong, any worm that you see in your yard or wriggling around in the forest um, is a non-native species. Potentially. <laughs> Maybe those native ones have made their way back up here somehow. But um, all right, here's a good question. Um, I know that once people start realizing um, that they have invasive species in their yard, it's always great to get it identified. And that goes for regardless of it being a plant or an insect. Um, it's always good to get it identified before you take action. Um, so someone does ask, how does one kill tree of heaven? And tree of heaven can look very similar to black walnut, which is a native species. So be sure to get identification. Um, so how does one kill tree of heaven outside of Roundup? Um, they said, I cut down a monster one, um, did not dig roots up because it would have killed adjacent tree, but they know that the stumps will regrow. So we'll start with that part of the question. Who would like to tackle that? I think um, <laughs> um, I'll throw that up, that one out there. <laughs> I, mean, I certainly have an idea from generally uh, plants need leaf matter to photosynthesize and, and generate or produce energy. So if your will is greater than that, that stumps will on reproducing new growth and you can stay consistent on cutting it. I've found results in that without uh, having to introduce Roundup, but it, it could take seasons, years to yeah. really control it. And depending on how many there are, if it's one or two, it's a lot more manageable than a forest of them or a larger area of it. Yeah, one method that I found that I've learned from other land managers that tends to be effective, but I don't think too many people would want to do this in their own yard, is you girdle the tree. Um, and, you know, like Jackson said, that can take a long time, especially if it is of a certain um, caliber, to actually kill it. 
Um, but that does stop the sprouts from coming up if you do that girdling method. If you don't do the girdling method, then you may have to deal with the sprouts. But like Jackson said, you just have to continue at it and don't give up. <laughs> don't give up at killing it. Um, not that I like talking about killing plants, but you know, sometimes it's got to be done. Sorry, go ahead, Haley. Yeah, so we've actually been talking about this a lot considering spotted lantern fly coming in and really loving Tree of Heaven. And, you know, it really especially does like those, that new growth. So if you're going to be trying to cut or girdle Tree of Heaven, um, and it can produce those, and it might produce those sprouts, um, that's going to be their favorite food for them to really eat. So you might be creating a really nice spotted lantern fly trap. And I don't know if maybe you're trying to get it to avoid other things. Maybe you're going to, you know, kill them there. Maybe you don't, that might not be something you want to do. Um, but we've actually been talking a lot about trying to figure out, because I know a lot of people don't really want to use Roundup. They don't want to use herbicides on their trees. And we're, we're starting to kind of understand maybe if you are girdling, trying to girdle earlier in the season, sometime before June. Um, and again, if people do this, let us know how it goes. Um, but as far as I know, from what I've been reading about girdling, that and what I've, I've have seen, I think at Hallockville County Park, I noticed some girdling that didn't look super successful. So um, girdling may in the wrong time of year could still lead to sprouting, um, which again, if you're hoping to avoid spotted lanternfly from coming to your, your property, I would say maybe avoid that, um, you know, right now. Yeah. Good advice. Yeah. So Kathy, I'm just going to um, ask you, I know we're getting close to the time when the webinar is ending. Um, and I know folks really want their questions answered. And I think if it's okay with you, Kathy, you know, we can certainly continue, or I don't know, Jackson, I, um, I know you have a family. <laughs> I don't want to keep you from your family. But um, I know that we can also address these questions. You can just email them to us and then we can all answer, provide our answers, and then you can email it to attendees. Yeah, so that's yeah. an option as well. Um, we I do want to mention one thing before um, I, I sent a couple of handouts to Kathy that she can share that includes one on our diagnostic lab. So if you have a question or, uh, or want to send a sample in or you can con contact them. So that's got all the information there. And there's also one of the handouts that had a little more details on some of the things we talked about today. Thank Wonderful. you. Um, I, we do have over 40 people still on the call. So um, as long as people are interested in hearing answers to questions, I think we should continue maybe for another 10 minutes, try to cover some of the more general questions um, and we can always respond to individuals afterwards, yeah. Okay, do you wanna put up the slide that has that contact information for folks? Um, sure, I can do some questions. Okay. All right, okay, so I'll see what other sort of questions we have. I know there's quite a few of them. Um, let's see. Um, somebody has questions about what do we plant and we will provide you resources in terms of how to answer that question. So we will email that to you because that question can take quite a bit of time. Um, Sorry, I'm scrolling through and I'm it's, not it's talking. Good thing <laughs> um, somebody's asking, wondering um, how come there aren't any naturally occurring sugar maples out there? And I think that's kind of a great climate change question that I'd love to um, put back to all of you as well. I know sugar maples are native to Long Island, but it's one of those species that is being affected by climate change and it keeps on getting pushed further and further north. And many of the sugar bushes that are out there um, are in danger of being negatively affected by climate change. So uh, let's see, um, Jackson, I'll start with you because you made the comment of seeing the changes in the forest from your childhood to now um, on the South Fork. So can you just comment a bit about the effects of climate change on our natural areas? Well, climate change, absolutely. Uh, you know, but more so on the South Fork, I want, I don't, I want to say that the, um, the growth of the population, the development, is probably the greatest uh, invasive species. However, um, you know, if just the same, we love our trees and plants on the South Fork. So I do see that they are, more people are receptive to um, uh, planting trees as they die, or as we have situations like we are with the invasives and with the Southern pine beetle, they're more prone, but they need good direction on what to plant and how to plant it. Something that, you know, the Colorado blue spruce, for a good example, it's just not cold enough for that. I haven't seen one do well in years. 
Um, you know, it needs that cold temperatures. Uh, so it's, even though it's blue and it's something interesting, it's not the right choice. And it's, it's plant selection moving forward that's going to really help elongate the uh, future uh, environment out here, the natives out here, whether it's native or non-native, it's, it's longevity. And, and um, that direction is important to get. That's a really good point. And somebody addressed that in the Q&A as well. Um, there are many Southern species of plants that are native and that they are starting to creep their way forward um, North as well. So I think it depends on your own philosophy and personal outlook on that topic, but it's good to be open to the idea of introducing some of these other um, Southeastern natives, dare I say it, uh, to our region, just for even that heat index effect. Um, I know the winter hardiness may be an issue, but our climate is um, certainly changing, or our weather is certainly affecting that in that regard. Um, Abby and Haley, I know that um, just like with you know rethinking some uh, native status of plants, you must be right on the forefront of thinking about these emerging invasive species as well. So can you comment a little bit on that and your work in uh, trying to locate some of these emerging invasive species? Yeah, for sure. There are, are, are many emerging invasive species. We, we do try to prioritize them based on one, you know, ones that are widespread, ones that, um, and then ones that are emerging. So we have like this whole tier system, which you could find on our website to learn more about that. Um, but yeah, part of that is doing the like um, horizon scanning. So figuring out what species are being problematic in other areas and um, listening to our partners that are in other neighboring states and keeping that for that. So that's one way that we make an emerging invasive species list. And then there are others that we you know only know a few populations of. So some examples of that are perennial pepperweed, um, which is more of a coastal plant, um, but that's one that we're definitely trying to eradicate in, in some areas. And um, another is arthroxon, which is an invasive, or arthroxon hispidus, which is an invasive grass. Um, so it's a matter of um, having people report these species whenever they see them, which is kind of hard because there are not that many of them. And then um, coordinating management, getting permits, getting in there to try to, to, try to eradicate them as soon as possible. Abby, Did anything and, to add, Haley? Oh, can I um, just follow up with a quick question yeah. on that? Are you finding any invasives that are being pushed out <laughs> because of climate change as well? So besides some of these emerging threats, um, are there any that are being pushed out because of the climate change? I mean, mm, top yeah. of my head, the only example that I have, only because I read about it earlier today, and I don't know if it's necessarily climate change, but um, you're, we're seeing in some of our aquatic systems, some uh, an aquatic plant such as hydrilla, which is also grows around Eurasian water milfoil. They're starting to see that where Eurasian water milfoil populations get too large, um, that it, it, they might be impacting the hydrilla populations and causing those hydrilla populations to die. So yeah, we are seeing, you know, starting to see some weird in, invasive, uninvasive um, action happening. And it would be really important to maybe if people are seeing that to comment to that and send it our way as well. Um, somebody asked about stilt grass and what they can do about it, um, you know, in the understory of the forest. I know that's a really tough one to manage, but um, I wanted to make sure that I brought that up as well. So if you guys could comment on that. Yeah, stilt grass is a really tricky one. Um, and again, if it's in a forest, if it's your forest, you know, and you it's your property, you can do a lot more. Um, but I'm not sure if it's, you know, public property, that's it's a little more difficult. Um, but something you can do if it's your yard, mulching it four to six inches might help. But again, mulching is going to prevent anything else from growing. So if you're trying to get other native plants that might be in your soil seed bed um, that you want to grow, those aren't going to grow either, more than likely. Um, you can remove it. You want to, you'd want to pull out as much of it as possible. And if you start cutting it and pulling it way too early in the season, it's a grass and it's still going to flower. So you have a really, really small time frame, probably like June through August that you might want to start pulling it up again, trying to get all those roots and getting it in a bag and making sure it doesn't spread anywhere um, and or cutting it in, in that season. Um, but again, you want to be doing it sort of before it sets seed because once it sets seed, 
it's going to move all those seeds everywhere. So you really got to be keeping an eye. I know they're small flowers and small seeds, but you know, trying to figure out that time frame, that perfect time frame. Um, and then lastly, the one of the best things that has been promoted for this, if it's an option for you, is some sort of grass um, specific herbicide. Um, and I believe we have more information on our website specifically about Japanese silkgrass to um, management. And I will say it's patience. It's going to take about three to seven years if you start doing any sort of really intensive Japanese silkgrass removal. Yeah, I think patience is the key takeaway when it comes to some of these management issues. All right, so there's another question that's asking um, about what to plant. Uh, so Larry is asking about, we have just fenced in a large section of our woods where the deer had eaten nearly all the understory. What would be the best thing to plant in our hickory, sassafras, black walnut, maple woods? We live in the village of Shoreham. That's a great question. <laughs> and, um, you know, a part of me struggles with that question just because if it is the woods, you know, in your area, once you start disturbing the soil, you're risking the introduction of invasive plants um, or invasive, um, just invasive plants and species in general. So, um, Jackson, uh, I'm sure you must get this question if you're still there. Um, could I'm you still address here. that question? Or and it is not an easy question without seeing the site and certainly without, you know, I know that in certain areas, because we're heavily dare damaged out east here, if you just let it alone, it'll start to recover on its own. And it's going to be as long as there's not an invasive species already there, it's more prone to be revegetated with what is doing well in that site. Now, there's also an aesthetic to it. Um, if you were to introduce anything but it's best, a lot of this is just leave it alone. We, outside of the deer, we tend to create a lot of issues as uh, homeowners and, and um, uh, best to see the site to give a better answer. Okay, thank you. Um, someone is asking about mites and if they affect our native roses. So Dan, I would love for you to address our quest that question. I know there are three uh, native roses to Long Island. The um, Rosa Carolina, the Rosa Palestris, and the Rosa Virginiana. So Dan, if you can discuss the Rose Rosette, I think that's the Rose Rosette that they're referring to. Um, yeah, yeah, for yeah. Question. yeah, it's a good question. Um, the one I do know about, at least there's really strong evidence that Rosa Palestris is resistant or is not infected. Um, there was a situation I've seen uh, an entomologist, to uh, acarologist who actually studies mites like these, um, found infected multiflora rose growing around a pond that also had Rosa palustris, one of our uh, sw swamp roses. And the swamp roses are doing just fine. They have no infection whatsoever. They look great, whereas the uh, multiflora were declining. I'm not as clear about the other ones. I think Carolina does get it. I, uh, um, I am not sure about the other, but... Um, it would be it would be good to find out for sure, and I I'm, I think that information is around. Uh, but Palustris is the only one of two I think that are known not to either get it or to be fairly resistant. All right, thanks, Dan. So I think I'm just going to address one more question, and it's one of my favorite questions in general. And um, someone is asking about where can I buy native trees of a good size, and I can understand um, the inclination or the preference of wanting to buy a good size tree. But when you purchase um, a large tree, so that's anywhere, in my opinion, a four inch caliper and greater, um, they can have a hard time establishing. So it just takes them that much longer to rebuild a root system that was cut up you know, from the field. Um, or even if you get a container plant, um, you still have to wrangle that root system to put it in the ground. So it takes a bit for it to establish. So um, you're asking about one that, uh, you know, trees that aren't crazy expensive. If you buy one inch, two inch, maybe even three inch caliper trees, and you make sure that you're not planting them too deeply in the ground, um, then they have uh, a good shot at establishing successfully and growing quickly. Those trees that are larger caliper, they take, um, it's one year to basically uh, make up to recover that 
root, um, the original root size. So if you have a one inch caliper tree, it just takes one growing season to recover um, any roots that were lost at planting. And then it will, you know, the whole sleep, creep and leap type of mentality around for planting. Um, they'll grow a lot faster than a larger caliper tree. Granted, well, I know the instant- a good size tree might be a smaller tree then, right? Exactly, yeah. So uh, I know the instant status um, gratification thing can be difficult with these smaller trees, but there's something in the pleasure of watching trees grow as well. But uh, Jackson, if you just wanted to do some of the final comments about uh, purchasing some of these large trees, since I know you have experience with that. I agree. I agree what you just said. And, and that instant gratification can end with pretty slow death. Um, so finding the right size tree, um, it varies with everybody, but primarily a four inch is the right size to see um, it catch up to a, say an eight inch caliper tree. But for location, there's nurseries all around the island um, that that sell these trees and best to probably reach out to the nursery association or even uh, Cornell or uh, reach out to your local uh, landscaper or arborist. Yeah, and the, um, the Long Island Horticulture Resource Guide, um, it does list some, well, it's wholesale, it's mostly wholesale growers, but it lists a lot of um, plant material as well um, for you to kind of peruse. But like Jackson said, go to your local retail garden center um, or there are professional associations uh, such as the Long Island Arboricultural Association and the Long Island Nursery and Landscape Association. There's the, oh goodness, they just changed their name, but they're the Landscape Contractors Association of Long Island. I think that's what they're called now, Landscape Contractors Association of Long Island. So there's a lot of professional associations that you can reach out to, to kind of learn um, of the scope of uh, the local production here on Long Island. So Kathy, I think we're going to pass it to you now. <laughs> Wow. This Final is, comments. It's been so wonderful to have you all chiming in with such great information. Um, I'm so excited and I'm thrilled that we have had a lot of people hanging in there for a little bit longer period of time, but there's so much information to share. So I just want to thank you uh, for, thank everyone for tuning in. And of course, thanking all of our panelists for sharing their expertise this evening and Mina for doing a great job as our moderator. Um, we are, we have recorded this um, program, so if you want to go back and check it out, it will be on our website blog within the next couple of days. Um, and we also will be sending out some information to everyone who registered, uh, just follow up information that Dan has provided to us. Um, so if you go to the blog, um, there's a number of other programs that we've offered throughout the last couple of years during these virtual times. Uh, so feel free to take a look and hopefully enjoy some of those. So um, with that, I, I think it's time to, uh, to get on with our evening. So thank you again, everyone for being a part of our program and we look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs>